Hi, welcome to Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist. Today I'll be taking you through the thinking behind my decision to take the COVID vaccine. I'll be taking you through four key important areas in making that informed decision. Firstly, the structure of the virus and how the virus enters the body. Second, how the immune system reacts to this virus. Third, the principles behind the vaccine. And fourthly, the risk benefit analysis, focusing on the risk aspect of this particular virus. I'm a consultant psychiatrist with a special interest in psychoneuroimmunology. I've published in the field of autoimmunity and psychiatry. I've published a detailed review on the neuropsychiatric manifestations of antiphospholipid syndrome. In fact, in COVID, there are increased rates of antiphospholipid antibodies, which is postulated as one of the mechanisms for the increased rates of thrombosis and the manifestations of thrombosis. I've also published a detailed review in the Cycine Hub on the neuropsychiatric manifestations of COVID. And I've also done a video on this channel. Please do have a view of that particular video for further information on the neuropsychiatric manifestations of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So without further ado, let's get started. Firstly, let's look at the structure of the virus. The key aspect of the coronavirus is the spike glycoprotein. And this particular spike glycoprotein is essentially what makes the crown of the virus. Corona meaning crown. What the virus does is it utilizes this spike glycoprotein to bind to the ACE2 receptor, which is situated on our cells, fuses with it to enter our cell. Now, viruses are acellular, which means that they can't replicate on their own. They need our cellular machinery to package themselves and create multiple other virions. And viruses often require, they have certain mechanisms through which they enter our cells. So for example, when we think about the influenza virus, it basically goes through production of a coated pit, the endosome, and then replication. When we think about the polio virus, we can see it uses a method called attachment and it releases its genetic material. Then we have HIV, which binds to the CD4 receptor for entry. Now, we know that the coronavirus is an RNA virus. So what it essentially does is, as mentioned earlier, it has the spike protein. The spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor situated on the cell, results in fusion and endocytosis, then penetration. And once it penetrates, it will then release the RNA. And the mRNA, the code really, that's present in the virus will utilize the cellular machinery, produce proteins, package themselves. So the viral ribonuclear protein that's there, it will package in itself in a process known as assembly, budding, blebbing, and the release of multiple other variants. So you can imagine when this process is uncontrolled, the infection, the uh, production of variants is really, really significant. Next, let's look at the immune system response. Now, the immune system consi consists of the cellular immunity and humoral immunity. Cellular immunity is usually the initial stages, while humoral immunity consists of the antibody-mediated response. So what essentially happens here is, firstly, phagocytes will encounter the virus, it will engulf the virus. Next, parts of the virus the antigen will go to the surface of the phagocyte and this phagocyte will then present it to the T cell, to a helper T cell. The helper T cell will be activated as a result. Now the helper T cell will start mounting the initial cellular immune response. So the helper T cell will take that antigen and present it to T cells. The T cells will then produce in inflammatory cytokines to destroy the virus. 
Now we know in some vulnerable individuals, cytokine storm, an exaggerated inflammatory response, can result in disastrous consequences, including death. The next uh, immune response or stage of the immune response is the humoral immune response. And what you can see here is the B cell. So the T, the helper T cell recruits the B cells, which constitute that humoral response. Now there are two types of B cells, the plasma cell and the memory cell. So the plasma cell produces antibodies that attach to the invader to destroy it. But the memory cells, as the name suggests, will basically help, will remember the virus or the antigen, the part of the virus that the weapon, if you want to think about it that way, it'll remember the weapon and it will activate the immune response much faster because the memory cell, the next time you encounter the virus, it will recognize it and go straight to the antibody mediated response, not needing the entire process, so saving valuable time. So knowing that, what is the principle of the vaccine? Vaccine, essentially, the principle behind the COVID vaccine is that the vaccine delivers in various forms the mRNA. Now, this mRNA is the code. It delivers a code not for the whole virus, but only for the spike protein. Now, recall that the spike protein was the weapon through which the coronavirus binds to the ACE2 receptor to enter our cells to replicate. What the vaccine is doing is just delivering the mRNA the code to produce spike protein to attack, to mount an antibody response the next time it encounters it. And that's why we have the second dose because the second dose is training our immune system to recognize the weapon a lot faster. So what a vaccine is doing is essentially training our immune system, especially the B cells to mount an attack faster because it will recognize the spike protein, destroy the spike protein, and that's the principle behind the vaccine. So what happens to the mRNA? The mRNA basically gets destroyed. It's like a Facebook story or an Instagram story or a Snapchat message. It's gone. Of course, when we talk about risk benefit analysis, that it reduces the spread as well. So from a utilitarian societal perspective, that's another argument to take into account as well. Now, let's think about the risk-benefit analysis. I'm sharing this because this may assist you in making a decision for yourself and, of course, for your uh, loved ones as well. So whenever we think about risk, we've got to think about three aspects because it's not dichotomous, yes or no. We've got to think about, firstly, what is the probability of exposure to that risk? Secondly, we've got to think about what are the average consequences of exposure? to that risk. If I get that particular exposure, what are the average consequences? And the third one is what are the tail consequences, the tail end events, the most severe events. And that's how we carry out a risk benefit analysis. analysis. So what's happening currently with the coronavirus? We know that the Delta strain is extremely uh, contagious. Uh, generally, coronavirus is, uh, is a a virus that is contagious, right? So with the Delta strain, of course, the probability has gone up. Now you can think about it either in terms of the Delta strain or the, or the disease as a whole, but essentially we're looking at the probability of exposure going up. Secondly, the, what are the average consequences? The average consequences, evidence shows us that more than 50% of cases tend to have what's called long COVID. Now written about long COVID in the article uh, on the Cyxine Hub, so do have a read of it, but essentially it affects the brain and the body and can result in chronic disability. And that's a big number to think about, the average consequences of exposure. So I've got to think about that as well. And of course, we know that the Delta uh, strain can be more severe as well, particularly in younger individuals as well. So we've got to think, and even if we don't think about the Delta strain, generally this particular contagious disease We've got the probability of exposure up. We've got average consequences, long COVID. And we also know that the severe consequences can be death, respiratory failure, etc. So I'm looking at essentially a disease that is dangerous when I think about these particular three events. 
So when taking into account the risk benefit analysis, it's not just about focusing on the severe bits, but also thinking about what is the probability of exposure. Is my probability, individual probability going up? Secondly, what are the average consequences as a result? When this goes up, this goes up as well, and this goes up as well. They're all linked. So with regards to the vaccine, it's important to recognize that it's training the immune system to recognize the spike protein and mount an attack to disarm it in a way. What it's doing is providing us with an extra layer of protection through this training of the immune system. That extra layer of protection feeds into the risk benefit analysis, protecting us from the average and severe consequences. And of course, the utilitarian and the societal argument protecting society as well. So one may argue it's an altruistic act as well. So I hope that this video has given you an insight into my decision making behind taking the COVID vaccine. Of course, none of this is to be construed as medical advice and any individual decision do discuss it with your general practitioner, with your doctor to allow you to make an informed decision. Take care and stay safe. Thank you.